I think the Psalms are deeply emotional. Uh, I think the reason why the Psalms are very helpful and encouraging is because it's so raw, so real. The Psalms are very intense. Sometimes they make us uncomfortable. And I think it's important that as we go through things in life, that as people who are emotional people, that's the way God's made us, that we don't just stuff our emotions, that we don't just vent our emotions, but rather that we learn to pray our emotions to God. And that's what we see the psalmist doing a lot in the Psalter. And here, I think in, in Psalm 3, what we have is the most primal of all the emotions. You see, I've got four kids. Uh, I've got four babies. I'm so tired. I don't sleep very much, but it's such a blessing. But they all came out crying. All four of my kids, when they were born, came out crying. And I thought about what are, what are those tears all about? Uh, were the babies crying because they were full of doubt? Are the babies coming out saying, oh, I don't know about this. I, I don't know if this is a good idea. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I don't think so. Are there tears of sorrow and grief? And I think that's maybe a little bit too complicated for a baby to kind of uh, understand or to feel. But I think rather the first sound, even our first sound when we were born into this world, is a wail of fear, a crying of fear. The baby comes out saying, where are the walls? You know, where are, where, why is it so cold here? Who has a finger down my mouth? Who's grabbing me? Who's hitting me on my bottom? And, and so on and so forth. What's going on? Everything was fine. I'm scared now. It's all new what's going on. And I think that's, the, that's what, the, what the baby's feeling is fear. And that's the way you and I come into the world. Fear, therefore, is maybe the most primal of all emotions. And that's what I believe David here in Psalm 3 is feeling. There's a problem here. David is running for his, his life. His own son, his very own son, is rebelling against him. And so here is David in the middle of the night fleeing from his own son, fleeing for his own life. And so he's afraid. And that's why it says in verse 5 and 6 that he will not be afraid. Why? Because he is afraid. He was afraid. He's scared for his life. And see, why did David pray this in Psalm 3? Again, his son Absalom rising against him, uh, declared himself king. And David is experiencing, first of all, in verse 1, when he says that, Oh, Lord, how many are my foes? Here is a guy who says, everybody is after me. Tens of thousands of people are after me. And he's right, unfortunately, for him. And you see him, he's being attacked, maybe physically. He's in bodily harm. His health is in jeopardy. But if you go to verse 2, we have something even deeper because it says, many are, are saying to me that God will not deliver him. There's no salvation in God. So it's not just a physical harm and anxiety that he's feeling, but it's an internal thing. There is restlessness, a lack of peace. But more than that, I think there is an internal attack, a spiritual attack, attack on his faith. So what's going on here is that David is not just being attacked physically, but he's being attacked psychologically and spiritually. And so what does this teach us? Why is Psalm 3 relevant? I think it's very relevant for us in this day. It's because I think many people are afraid. Maybe you are afraid. Maybe I'm afraid. I think there's a lot to be concerned about. But I think there's a lot of reasons why Psalm 3 is relevant. What is causing anxiety and fear for you this morning? COVID-19, health issues, family matters, relationships for some of our students who are going back to school, grades, financial crises. And there are many moments throughout this new year, even though we launch into it with confidence and boldness and with faith, things will happen in our lives that will bring about fear, no doubt. So what can we learn? Number one, I think we need to remember his shield. See, David is really at the bottom, and what he's going to do, he's 
feeling a lot of fear. And it says in verse 3, but you, O Lord, are shield about me. And I think verse 3 is really important that it starts with the word but. He's saying, I'm scared, I'm depressed, I'm angry, I'm doubtful, I'm guilty. But whatever your feelings are, the first words in verse 3 is very important. But I'm scared, but he's going to do something. He's going to turn to the Lord and he's going to remember some things in his life that are truth. So he remembers God's shield. In other words, he's saying that you, Lord, are a shield about me. Even though enemies are all around, there's a lot to be afraid. There's things that are out to get me. And there's internal anxiety within me. He remembers that God is his ultimate protection. God will protect him. He puts his faith in the one that is sovereign, that is providential. That in spite of the dire circumstances, he says, God is my protection. He remembers God's shield. But furthermore, he says he's going to remember God's glory. He remembers his glory, God's glory. What does he say literally in second part of verse 3? In, in the Hebrew, he's literally saying this, you are my glory and the lifter of my head. Why would he say that? You are my glory. And, and I want you to forget, he's saying, but you are my glory. But, verse 3 again, but you are my shield, but you are my glory. I'm scared, but you are my glory. Now, he, he wouldn't say that. He wouldn't say, but you are my glory, unless something else was his glory. You see, I, I think there's a lot of, that he was building his identity, his value, his worth, self-worth. He built his emotional and maybe even psychological peace and security on a lot of other things besides God. And here's a man, very successful. He is the king after all, and he is, you know, a, a good king or a, a, a great king. Maybe he thought he was a good father. Well, that illusion, that delusion is now real. He's not a good father. And he might think he has a good moral record, but that's not, that's, he realized that's not happening anymore. What's glory? The word glory means weight. And so it means that, it means significance. And what he was saying is that these were good things that I had located my significance, my glory in all of these other things. I had located my security in them. I felt secure. I felt good in life that I was a king and that maybe I had the approval of the people in my kingdom. It's good to be talented or at something. It's good to be a good spouse or to have a spouse who loves me. It's good to have children who, that you've taken care of. All of these things are good, but if you locate your glory in them, what you've done is you put your glory, your worth, your security in something that is finite. Finite things are out there in time and space, and they're vulnerable to circumstances. And David realized that's what he had done. And he's examining his heart. He's really looking and saying, why am I so anxious? Why am I so fearful? Well, it's because, David, you've put your glory, your significance, in all of these things besides God. In other words, you've made an idol out of all of these things, and they're not bad things. Working, your career, your jobs, school, your relationships, your friendships, even religion and faith, those are great things. Church, you know, those are great things. But if you've put your identity, yourself with your glory, your weight in all of these things, no wonder we are so full of fear and anxiety. And what David has come to his sense, he says, I need to relocate and remember that he is my glory. That in him, I need to find my worth, my identity, my value. I think this year of 2022, it's a good opportunity for us to recalibrate our hearts to say, Lord, you have to be the center of my life. You have to be in the very center of my heart no one else and nothing else. No one else and nothing else. And lastly, as I close, what David does is he remembers the substitute. Remembers the substitute. David is saying, I failed in every way, but I know that you are the lifter of my head. I know that you honor me. I know the knowledge that you are proud of me, my glory. How does he know that? 
He gives a hint in verse 4, but in some ways the whole psalm is a hint. What does he say in verse 4? He says, I will cry to you. He doesn't just say, I will cry to you and you will hear me, but he says, I will cry to you and I have confidence that you're going to hear me. Why? Because of your holy hill. It says that in verse 6. What's the holy hill? The tabernacle on Mount Zion, the place of sacrifice. And so David, I think he's realizing that his sins can be dealt with. But is that all he knew? Did he just know in some vague and general way when he saw the sacrifice on the altar that somehow God was somehow dealing with his sins? I don't think so. I think there's more to what he's, what's going on here. I think it reminds us of Genesis chapter 15. Because the reason why I think David was thinking about Genesis 15 is because the same words are shown is used in the beginning of Genesis 15 as Psalm 3 because Abraham there is scared. God comes to Abraham and says, don't be afraid, Abram. And here we have a situation where God is trying to help Abram with his fear. And what does he say to Abram? How does he deal with his fear? He's, he tells Abram, I am your shield and your glory, your very great reward. It's almost impossible, I think, for me to believe David, who would have known Genesis 15, was not thinking about this because David is trying to heal his own anxiety, to heal his own fear, exactly the way God healed Abram's fear in Genesis 15. When he was thinking about Genesis 15, what was he thinking about? Abram was scared in Genesis 15, and God said, I'm your shield. I'm your glory, Abraham. Abram says, how do I know this? And then in Genesis 15, uh, verse 8, how can I know this? God did something that night that is very famous. It speaks about the covenant, right? It speaks about how God tells Abram, I'm going to make a covenant vow with you. So God tells Abram, take a bunch of animals, take a goat, heifer, ram, a bunch of birds, and they cut them up and they spread them on both sides. Right? And Abraham immediately knew what was going on, that this was going to be a vow. And in those days, the way you made a contract was not to sign something on a piece of paper. It wasn't some notary stamp that you would just put on it, but it was something more than that. What they would do is they would cut up an animal, and you'd walk between the pieces as you made your vow together. And what does that mean? What you were doing is you were identifying with the cut up animals and that if you were acting out against the contract, the vow, then what happened to these animals would happen to you. You were saying, if I do not do all the things that I'm saying today, if I don't keep my promises that I'm making today, may it be as this animal, may I be cut into pieces and thrown out into the wilderness to be eaten by the vultures and the jackals and the wild animals. And that night, God came down, he did, Darkness showed up. Abram was amazed because he saw a smoking tor torch pass between the pieces. It was the theophany of God. God showed up. It passed between the pieces, and the Lord said, I promise to give this blessing to you and your descendants. Abram realized God was taking an oath. God was identifying with the animals. God was saying, I promise to honor you, take away your sins and give you this blessing, even if I have to be cut up, even if I have to be cut off, and even if I have to pay the price of your disobedience, I'm going to bless you. And David, I believe, knew that. And that's how David could say, you are the lifter of my soul. And David didn't know, didn't know what you and I know today, this morning, and that is that God did do that. Here's how God did it. Centuries later, darkness came down on Calvary's hill. And Jesus, as Isaiah said, was cut off from the land of the living. That's how you and I know that he is proud of us, that he loves us, that he is the keeper of his promises, even when we fail. And David failed. Even though he was a man after God's own heart, he was a murderer and he was an adulterer. He failed as a father. And yet... He knew that God forgave him, and he found his hope and strength in God. And that's the way he prayed his fears. He was able to overcome his anxiety and fear by remembering that God was his shield, that God was also his glory, 
and that God was his substitute. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your word. And may we, Lord, continually be in your word every single day of our lives. And we pray that this year especially that we would, Lord, all the more be vigilant and be committed to prayer and to being in your word. Father, we thank you for the gospel that gives us hope. And for many people, there is reason to be concerned, but indeed we don't need to be panicking in any way. We don't need to be truly, um, be hopeless. To be afraid and to have anxiety is normal because we're human beings, we're made of flesh. But Lord, we know that we can overcome our fear and anxiety because we know that you are our shield, you are our glory, and you are our substitute. And we find our hope and our strength in you. In Christ's holy name we pray, amen.